songwriter said, pass me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble cry, while on others thou art passing, do not, do not pass me by. I wonder if any one of us have ever been in that situation where you just feel like everything is just, uh, it seems like everyone around you is being favored or being blessed by God. And you look at where you are, you look at your current situation, and of course your heart cries, God, everyone seemed to be getting ahead and doing well, and I, for some reason, seem as if I am stuck. But I want to say to you this morning that you are not stuck. God is not through with you yet, and I believe that your best days are before you. I want you to turn to the person that is sitting next to you and say to them that your best days are ahead of you. Go ahead and say that. Amen. And turn to the person on the other side and say to them, your best days are ahead of you. Amen and amen. God bless you. Welcome to the house of the Lord. Welcome to the presence of the Lord. God bless you. It is my prayer that the songs that have been sung, it um, God took us on a different path. It is, uh, uh, <laughs> it's those good old songs. And there is something about the good old song, not to say that there is anything wrong with the songs that we sing uh, now, but there was just something about them, how they were written, how they were penned. There is a story behind it, and there is the salvation message behind it, not to say that the songs now, they don't have uh, that, but there is something about the environment, the times in which they live that allow them to pen the songs that they pen and sing it the way they did and deliver it the way they did and minister the way they did. And we see that those songs, when they are played, they still have the same effect on us. And I just want to say to us this morning that what the Lord wants you and I to do is to get to that place where we lose ourselves in him and we're able to then find ourselves in him. So I know it sounds a little bit strange, but when we get into the presence of the Lord, we have to give up a whole lot in order to gain and to garner what God has in store for us. Again, welcome to the house of the Lord. Welcome to the presence of the Lord. Glad that you're able to join us. We are going to allow the Lord just to have his way because there is this feeling in my spirit that the Lord want us to take our time this morning. I believe that he is setting the tone because somebody is going to say, I yield, I yield, God, I can continue on this pathway. That is it. I am at the crossroads. There is a decision that is warranted. And God, the decision that I'm making, that decision is to be sold out 110% to watch you. So I'm going to pray at this time and then allow the Lord to have his way. Spirit of the living God, we come before you this morning. The songwriter said, pass me not, O gently Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not. Do not, O oh God, pass me by. The songwriter goes on and he says, Savior, Savior, blessed Savior, hear my humble cry while on others thou art passing. Do not, do not, O oh Lord, pass me by. And I just pray this morning, God, for your sons and your daughters who find themselves in that situation this morning where their hearts cry is, God, do not pass me. God, if you go and you leave me where I am, my God, I, 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 I'm destitute. I, I, I don't want to relive the things and experience the things that I've experienced. Your presence is here. And like Moses this morning, we are saying, God, if your presence don't go before us, my God, we don't want to go. Spirit of the living God. We come before you this morning and we quiet our minds and our hearts and we wait on you. We wait on you. We say, go before us, O oh God. And whatever it is that you decide that you want to do this morning, my God, we take a step, two steps, three steps back and we allow your Holy Spirit to minister and to do what you need to do in this atmosphere and in this climate that you have created. God, I bring all our fears and our doubts and all our concerns before you this morning. My God, and I lay it at the foot of the cross and I say, have your way. 
have your way, O oh God, we might think that our circumstance it is uh, unique. This has never been seen before, but your word reminds us, God, that there is nothing new under the sun. So where we are, what we're dealing with, what we're wrestling with, my God, you have a history of, 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 of delivering and bringing people out of those circumstances. It's just that we have not connected with you the way we need to connect. So our story can be penned and written on the resume of heaven that my God delivers against spirit of the living God. We just come before you this morning, my God, and if somebody will just surrender their circumstance, their situation to you and say, God, I give it all to you. And God, truly, we will see that Daniel's God truly will deliver. Daniel's God has delivered, and Daniel's God is getting ready to deliver again. But God, we must first connect with you, spirit to spirit, as the scripture uh, uh, dictates to us that God is a spirit, and they that worship him must, must, not should, not maybe, must worship him in spirit and in truth. And so we come before you at this time, oh God, and we quiet our minds and our hearts, and we say, have your way. Have your way this morning in your service. God, we look to you this morning and we say thank you in Jesus' name. We pray amen and amen and amen. God bless you. Welcome to the house of the Lord. Welcome to the presence of the Lord. Truly, God's presence is in his house and it is in a different uh, experience that God is choosing to reveal himself to us. It's kind of like what Hebrews 1 and 1 says in that it says, God at sundry times and diverse manner spoke. Amen. So God speaks to us on a number of different ways. He chooses to express himself to us however way he chooses. And it is the responsibility of his church and his people to find ourselves in that place where we look at what is going on, we connect with heaven, and we confirm with God, God, is this you? And if it is God, then the expectation is that you would ride with him. In other words, he's, as, as the young people would put it, he's my ride, and die, ride or die. So that is what God is expecting us to do when he shows up and he begins to minister unto us. The expectation is that we will have a place prepared in our heart to hear what he is saying to us because he is getting ready to reveal. He's getting ready to impart revelation. God's church grows through the revelation. It is the revealed word of God. It is the word of God that changes and transform every circumstance and situation. And uh, if we make ourselves available to hear him, then we will find that things will become clear. Things will become a little bit different. Let me get into our text this morning because I just feel that God has not released me to move. Uh, we'll go to Deuteronomy chapter number Number eight, Deuteronomy chapter number eight. My God, we are going to look at the first six verses, and then I'm going to get out the way, and God is surely going to have his way this morning. If you look, you'll see that there's a table that is set, and he has placed it on my heart over the course of this week. My God, where I hear the plea in that we're saying, God, change my diet. Lord, uh, uh, help me to change my diet. It is said that we are what we eat. And if we are what we eat, my God, and if what we're eating is not allowing us to grow in the, the way in which God intends us to grow in his presence, then it simply means that something is required. Let me say this to you about this Christian walk and this Christian uh, relationship that we have with God. One word describe or walk in our relationship with God, and that is the word change. We are not, and we will never get to the place where we uh, get a revelation, implement the revelation in our life, and then that is it. No, that revelation move you out of, of think about a step, if you will, we have these rungs that you have to go to continuously grow. That revelation take you from here 
to hear, and this is not where it stops. Scripture says that there are higher heights and deeper depths in God, and we have to strive to get to that place in him. Deuteronomy chapter number eight, <clears throat> we'll start at verse one, and it says, every commandment which I command you today must be careful, you must be careful to observe. My God, that you may live and multiply, go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to your father. So understand what the Lord is saying is that everything that he gives unto us, it is imperative that we, my God, not only observe it, but it's in, it, it is imperative that we implement them in our lives so that we can see, my God, that we truly serve a God who can take the impossible and make it possible. Verse two, it says that, you shall remember the way you shall remember, my God, you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all these 40 years in the wilderness and underline this to humble you, underline this to test you, to know what is in your heart. Underline that because that's what we're going to talk about this morning, how God led us in a, in, a, in a wilderness and he declares to us, he answered the question, maybe some of us may be in that place place where we're asking ourselves the question, God, why am I going through this? Why is it that things have been this way for such a long time? God, answer the question, because Deuteronomy chapter number eight, it is a point of reflection where God is having this reflection and this conversation with the children of Israel as they get ready to transition into the promised land. So the question he is now answering for them, I led you through the wilderness for these 40 years, one to home you want two to test you and then three to prove what is really and truly in your heart my 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 to know what is in your heart whether you would keep his commandment or not watch this so he humbled you and allow you to hunger god why would you allow me to experience hunger my god and this is where it gets good for us because understand this while they're in a desert and they're going through and they uh, are hungering and desiring the things of egypt god is now presenting to them new things and you see it is this new diet that god is introducing to them and and and, and, and we're going to find that when god begins to introduce new things into our diet it is not something that we run and we embrace right away. My God, we taste it. And, 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 and if it doesn't taste, because you see, there is no point of reference that we could uh, 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 use in our mind to say, this reminds me of this, or this reminds me of that. When God begins to introduce new things in our diet, it is going to take some time for us to uh, develop a taste and an appetite for the things of God. But if, 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 if we continue to take small bites and uh, 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 begin to just taste what the scripture says in that it says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusts in him. You see, we have to take small size bites with the things that God is introducing us to. And when we begin to take small size bite, we begin to build up a taste and a desire for the things of God. So if God puts something on your plate and he introduced something new to you, the immediate reaction to what he introduced, it, it, it may not be something that you welcome and you run towards. You may put it in your mouth for a while, you chew it, and we begin to say, what does this kind of feel like or what does this kind of taste like? And we work our way to to where we begin to build up a desire and a taste for the things of God. God changed my appetite and God says to us now in three, so he humbled you and allow you to hunger and feed you with manna. This is the new thing which God is now feeding the children of Israel as they transition out of slavery. Watch this, which uh, 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 let me read that again. So he humble you and allow you to hunger. He, hum he hum humble, allow you to experience hunger. And now he introduced this new thing to you, which is called manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers that he make you to know that man shall not live by bread alone, but by, but man lives by every word that proceed from the mouth of God. Watch this. Your garment did not wear out on you 
you, nor did your feet swell these 40 years. You shall know in your heart that as a man chasing his son, so your God chasing you. Therefore, you shall keep the commandment of your God to walk in his ways and to fear him. So understand, if you will, God is explaining to the children of God why things were the way they were. Not sure if you've ever been there where you find yourself in a season or in a period in your life where you are just going through, you're going through, as the old time folks would say, you're going through, you're going through, you're trying to get answered to questions that have plagued you. Why are things the way they were? And it seems as if the more you put forward human effort in trying to, my God, made forward progress, it's the more you find yourself uh, <laughs> repeating the same sets of mistakes. And it's not until you get on the other side of what you're struggling and dealing with, then you begin to inquire of the Lord and ask the question. And now he begin to speak to you as he's speaking to the children of Israel here, helping them to understand that because of their refusal to implement that which he has been talking to them about throughout this journey where they were enslaved, now they are free. God put in place instruction for them to move. And note this about the instruction that God gave to them. This journey, they said, should take uh, two weeks, up to two weeks from point A to point B. It should take them two weeks. But of course, we know, like the children of Israel, we too, when God began to speak and impart valuable information onto us, there is something inside of us that wants to wrestle and contest what God is saying to us. But we're going to look through the life of the children of Israel, and we're going to glean information from this that would be applicable in that it's going to help us to make better decisions. Spirit of the living God, your word has been read. Have your way this morning. We look to you and we say thank you in Jesus' name. One of the things that we do when we read God's word is that we ask ourselves the question, what do we know from the text that we have read? Again, my subject, it's this. You are what you eat. Lord, help me to change my diet. Amen. You are what you eat. It is said that we are what we eat. And this morning, we're asking the Lord to help us to change our diets. You see, some diets, we change it voluntarily. Some diet, it takes drastic measures for us to <laughs> change and to implement uh, uh, what is best for us because there are some acquired tastes that we have and it's not easy to give up those things. So the question that we ask when we read God's word is this, what do we know from the text that we have read? Here is what we know. In the text we read this morning, the Lord is asking the children of Israel, uh, the Lord is rather taking the children of Israel down memory lane, reflecting on his goodness towards them and encourage them to remain devoted and loyal to him. In verse two, he offers clarity and context to the question that they may have that may have lingered in their mind. He says to them, "Remember the way that I take you this forty years. One, we under we talked about this earlier, which is to humble you, two, to test you, and to prove what is in your heart." In verse three, the Lord further explained that I allow you to experience hunger so that I can. Feed you. Have you ever been there where there is a hunger and a desire for a particular thing, and that hunger and that desire for that particular thing just drive you to maybe drive five miles, 10 miles, 15 miles, 20 miles to get that particular thing that you desire? Why? Because it 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 it, it gives you a feeling of my, 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 this is so good, and I will drive up to 50 miles to go and get it. So I get it verse three, the Lord allow, the Lord rather explain that I allow you to experience hunger so that I can feed you. I introduce you to manna. 
The word mana means what is this? So think about this. God is introducing mana to them. And when they get it, 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 it is something that is new. It is something that is different. It is something that they have no point of reference to. And we're going to talk about why it was the way it was. Mana was a supernatural food prepared and presented to the Israelite in the desert by the hand of God for them to consume on a daily basis. He reminds the children of Israel that man should not live by bread alone, but it was imperative for man to modify his diet and to include the word of God. Why? Because it is said that we are what we eat. The Lord said to them in verse 3, I am introducing manna to your diets. Your forefather never had it, and thus there is, this will be an acquired taste for you. Let's take a step back, if you will, and look at the plight of the children of Israel. The children of Israel were enslaved for some 440 plus years. Think about this, if you will. The group that went into slavery, so say this is the group that went into slavery, they have what they have or they carried with them, if you will, their culture, their customs, and 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 their identity. There were things that were unique about them that that identified them as Israelite. Diets and food that they eat was a part of that. So think about this. You have this culture. Think about your culture that you are integrated in, that you identify with, and you are taken, my God, uh, uh, out of your culture, and you are taken into a foreign land, and everything about your culture, what identify you to be this particular uh, uh, group of people, it is now taken away from you. You are now forced to eat and to drop those things that made you who you are. This is where the children of Israel were. They were enslaved, and when they were taken into Egypt, Every aspect of their life was slowly eroded over some 440 plus years. Think about this, if you will. The group that went in, their relationship and everything about being an Israelite was intact. But now the group that is coming out, what we started with is not what we're ending with. And so if you look at it between this and this, there is a period here where God understand that erosion has taken place. They have lost their identity. The things that they are culturally uh, are known for, those stories are relayed to them verbally. And so it is the verbal uh, uh, repetition of saying and stating who they were that allowed them to uh, uh, remotely uh, uh, identify with, 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 with saying as Israelites, here is what we do. But we know that as time goes by, and we begin to verbally relate story, some of those information, it is going to change. And so the group that started and the group that is now coming out of slavery, some of that information has been watered down, modified, and now changed. And so now God frees them from slavery, and he says to them, there is a promised land that I have for you. And so the relationship that this group had, the desire, the taste, and who they were, this group does not have the same as it relates to our relationship with God. And so what God has to do, he has to take them through these experiences and he has to strategically integrate and, 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 and demonstrate to them who he was. In other words, just like this group that had an authentic experience and a relationship with God, this group that is coming out doesn't have the same. And so it is these difficult moments that God is now using to integrate and to reveal to him who Revealed to them rather who he was. And so when Moses stood up and we know the story, Moses go and he says to fear, God says to let my people go. God, while they were in Egypt, began to show them who he was. Because understand this, when they left, when they left before they went into slavery, 
They had a relationship with God. Now that they go and they are enslaved, they are introduced to new foreign gods. So the taste and the desire for a relationship with God, that slowly eroded and that changed. And so now the group that is coming out, everything, their outlook, their understanding and how they process a relationship with God, it is processed through the lens of an Egyptian outlook. Have you ever been there? My God, we're externally... You look like Israelites, but internally, my God, there, there is this fight and there is this complexity because now you are being introduced to the gods of your forefather. You heard these stories being relayed, but in your heart, you are holding on to an Egyptian outlook. And this is where God is beginning the work of changing and transforming their diets in that he is introducing himself to them. But of course, we know all habits die hard. And what they learn in Egypt, it is not going to go away that easily. And so thus, this is why God allowed them to go around in this desert for 40 years, because it took 40 years for them to uh, 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 get rid of that Egyptian outlook to where they can embrace the things of God. Have you ever been there? Where God has given you a word and he let you know that this is what I have in store for you. This is what you're getting ready to become. But because on the outside, we look and we dress like an Egyptian. You see, Egypt, it represents, when you look at Egypt and what it represents in scripture, it represents the world. So externally, my God, we are dressed my God, light the world, but internally, God wants to work a work on the inside to change our appetite and our desire, my God, and turn our hearts back to him. This is where the children of Israel were externally. They look like Egyptian, but internally, this is where the battle was. My point number one is this, you are what you eat. It is said that we are what we eat, and if we are what we eat, let me ask you this question. What have you been feasting on? If we are what we eat, my question to you this morning is, what have you been feasting on, both physically and spiritually? Have you been feasting on the word of God so that the word of God can change and transform your life in that what Psalm 119 and verse 9 says? It says that, where else can a young man change his or her ways but by taking heed thereof according to the word of God? Here is what the psalmist David encouraged, and he tells us, he said that, that word, O God, have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against thee. Let me say this to you. If you have been feasting just on the things of this world, then you're outlook and how you deal with what is on your plate, it is going to be through a worldly outlook and not through the word of God. Why? Because we are what we eat. If you do not think this is true, that is your what you eat, let me encourage you to make a bold decision today and change your diet, that is your physical food that you're eating, and for the next two years, let me ask you to do this, let me ask you just to eat just a fast food diet for the next two years. And I know I hear the question, preacher, why would I do that? And I see the looks on your face like, that doesn't make any sense. And I would have to agree with you based on the reaction. Why? Because we are what we eat. Because we know that a fast food diet, it is not the best thing for us. We may get a desire and a crave for it, and we go and we have it. And then once that desire is satisfied, we then move back to what seems to be what is a more balanced or a, 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 a better diet for us. We are what we eat. My God, consider this. If what we feed the physical man can drastically affect your health, your way of life, and your well-being, how much more careful and selective we are to be what we feed the spirit man. Because you see, there are two conversations that we're going to have here today. One has to do with what we feed 
the physical man, and the second one has to do with what we feed, the spirit man. If you think about what you feed yourself on a daily basis, are you selective? Are you deliberate? Are you intentional about what kind of food you eat every day? And for those of us who are not, we will understand the value of, 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 of good nutrition because what you feed yourself, it can either one, allow you to have energy to take on the task and the assignments that are before you, or two, my God, it will cause you to feel lethargic. It will cause you to feel as if it, <laughs> the world is just on your shoulder. We are what we eat and we must be selective, my God, with the things that we eat. Consider this for a moment. We have a newborn baby. It is necessary, it's important, it's imperative, my God, that we care for uh, this newborn. We make sure that they are nursed by mom and the formative years are so important what this baby is fed. Why? Because there are some uh, uh, benchmark that this young child has to hit. And, and, and the things that this young child is fed in their formative years allow them, my God, to hit those benchmarks. Remember for those of us who have young kids at home when they were born, they were a bundle of joy. And it, it, it seemed as if there is so much to care for this child. Remember sitting down and having conversation with doctors explaining to you the importance of a proper diet and good nutrition. Why? Because the child needs to grow and what we feed the child will determine and dictate how they grow. And there are some children who are not fed the proper nutrition. And so when they go to the doctors and the doctors begin to examine and do measurements and tests, they will inform the parents that, listen, here are some benchmark where this child needs to be. Your child may be here. And the sad reality about this, when we have to hear this, sometimes we think this is a reflection of us being bad parents, but sometimes there are certain circumstances surrounding that, that maybe a person is not comfortable talking about and explaining, my God, but once we receive insight and information that these are the things that you need to do to ensure that this child stay on this particular pathway and hit these measurements, my God, we then go and we implement this. This is what we do also in the spirit. When we are not where we should be spiritually with the Lord, we receive insight and revelation from heaven, helping us to understand that we're not hitting the benchmark that God uh, 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 would desire for us to hit. And so now God begins to reveal to you and he begins to reveal to me that, listen, here are some things you need to do. So on the next check-in that you and I have, and I, I, I evaluate you as a doctor would evaluate a young child, the expectation is that you should get here if you implement and apply, my God, the things that God is saying to us, we are what we eat. God says to them that I allow you to suffer hunger in the desert so that I can supernaturally provide for you and 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 and, and to refrain their minds and to refresh rather their minds their heart and their soul that uh, 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 this uh, uh, when you find yourself in my God the desert and you begin to hunger understand this every child of God should experience a desert experience. Preacher, why would you say that? You see, it is in a desert experience where we begin to hunger and we begin to thirst and we begin to look for things that normally satisfy the hunger and the thirst that we have. But understand this about a desert experience. You see, it is in a desert experience where we begin to build our relationship with God because now there is a physical hunger in the desert and we don't know, we don't understand what we need to uh, eat and what we need to feed ourselves and that will allow us to be sustained in the desert. 
Note this about the desert experience. Remember Moses, if we were to digress for a brief moment here and think about Moses. Remember Moses grew up in, uh, God, an Egyptian household. Moses understood and, 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 and he was fed the best of Egypt. And now when God wanted to change and to transform Moses' life, as he's doing with the children of Israel, God allow him to leave uh, 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 the lack of luxury if you will, and God took Moses through uh, 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 this desert experience. And understand this, Moses came from Egypt. Moses understood the lifestyle of Egypt, and now Moses brings that into a, 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 a desert experience. Moses now begins to experience hunger. Moses begins to experience thirst. Moses' point of reference on what to do came from an Egyptian outlook, but there was nobody there now to say to Moses, yes, do this and do that. And when you apply what Egypt has taught you, and you still see that there is that hunger and that thirst on the inside, this then allow you to look to God, because now you are looking to God, you are saying, God, I am hungry, and, 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 and I am thirsty, and all of these things are around me, and I do not know what to eat, because what you eat in the desert can cause you to live, or it can cause you to die, and now it is in this desert experience where God is now teaching Moses what to eat and what not to eat, and now Moses is now informed based on the word of God. Moses can now take the experience that he learned from God, and now he's leading the children of Israel through their desert experience and now what God imparted to him he can now impart that to God so let me say this to you that your desert experience is valuable to you why because God is teaching you some things in your desert experience why because there are some people who you will find that will need to navigate the same desert experience they would need to walk through the same experience and when they find themselves in a place where they want to give up and they want to quit it is what God has imparted onto you in that he has changed your diet while you're in this desert experience, you can now take what God has shared with you and you can stand next to somebody and say, listen, this is good for you to eat in the desert. Somebody might say, why? You can then explain to them that when you eat this, this is what it does for you. It may not make sense to them, but let me say this to you. While it is true that they're there and they're hungry and there is no other option, this now seems like something that is good. That when there is nothing else, note if you will, when there is nothing else, my God, we're, it's, it, it, it's no longer a buffet where you can pick and select and, and, and overlook certain things. God will provide this. He will provide something like this for you. Why? Because now he is teaching you there is a hunger and while you are introduced to manna, you do not understand the value of manna you don't understand the importance of manna. You have never seen manna before. You may stand and you may want to argue, but God is saying, until you begin to eat what I provide for you, that hunger will never be satisfied. Until you begin to taste and see that the Lord is good and blessed is the man that trusted in him, that hunger and that desire and that taste that is deep down on the inside that needs to be satisfied. I have provided for you, but until you engage that which I provide for you, then I can't do anything for you in this moment. God is waiting for you and I to open up our mouth and begin to taste the things that he's provided for us. You see, when we begin to look at it and we begin to argue and we begin to uh, evaluate and we begin to look and we begin to uh, uh, smell and we begin to do what we do when we are introduced to something new, my God, the hunger inside of you is not going away. So the longer you stay and you evaluate and you look at what God has provided for you, then the hunger still continues. And when we begin to hear those sounds coming from our stomach, my God, this now, uh, 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 we, 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 we may give it a, 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 a little bit of taste and we try it and we take small bites and we may allow it to move around in our mouth and we're saying to ourselves this it's not as bad, but think about this, if you will think about 
those of us who are going through our desert experience where God has provided for us in our desert experience. And because of what God has provided for us, it is something new, it is something different, it is something that we have never seen before. Think about the standoff that is going on in your heart and in your life as it relates to what God has provided for you. Let me put it to you in a way in which you understand. Think about when we had young kids and we gather at the table as a family to sit and to eat and you provide food before your children and they look at it, it was not desirable, it was not palatable, and thus they push it away and they said, I am not eating that. And you continue to coerce and you have these conversations encouraging them to eat what is before them, but because uh, uh, it, it, it doesn't look appealing to them, they may sit there. If you had one of those defiant child, that defiant child would have sat through dinner and you may have threatened the child to say, if you don't eat this, and if you don't do this, you're not going to play any games, you're not going to do this, and you're not, and you're doing that as a way to help your child to eat what is before you. I'm not sure. If, 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 if your child was the kind of child where vegetable was placed before them, and when you place the vegetable before them, they made up their faces and they're saying, they're yuck. As long as there is a standoff in your heart and in uh, uh, mine as it relates to what God has presented before us in our desert experience, we will continue to linger and delay our own deliverance. God again says to the children of Israel, I have provided for you manna. This is something that you do not know. This is something that you have never seen. Again, your forefathers, those who went into slavery, they have never seen this. And so I am doing a new thing. The new thing that I'm doing, I'm changing your palate, I'm changing your appetite, and I'm changing your desire, and I'm introducing something new to you. Understand this about the pushback, my God, that you see in your children. The same pushback was seen with the children of Israel, when things become challenging and things become difficult, there was a moment in time where, my God, the Egyptians were pursuing them when they were uh, uh, leaving Egypt. And they turn to Moses and they say, you brought us out here and now we're hungry. If we were in Egypt, we would be feasting on the onions and the garlics and those things. So you see, it is necessary at times, it is imperative, it's important that God allow us to experience hunger because you see, it is the hunger and the desire of things that we go after that says to God that we are ready or we're not ready for what he has in store for us. God allow them to, 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 to go through this desert experience and the desert experience and the hunger that they go through aided and assisted in changing their palate for what God has in store for them. Maybe that's where you are this morning. You are going through your desert experience. There is a hunger and, 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 and the things that you long for, you turn and you're looking for those things and they are nowhere in sight. And maybe your response to God this morning is like the children of Israel. If I was back there or if I was back there, at least I would have these things. And God is silent when you protest and he's simply saying to you day after day, he prepares manna for you, but as long as there is a standoff and you're not eating that which God provide for you, you will continue to complain, you will continue to protest, and the new things that God has in store for you, my God, you are delaying it based on your disobedience to partake of that which God is, 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 is now providing for you. The scripture says that he that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. Let me ask you the question this morning. What are you hungering and thirsting after? Note this. When you experience hunger in a desert place, your options are limited and you do not have the luxury of refusing what is presented before you. 
their hunger pointed to a, a, a need in their life and manna pointed to a supernatural provide provision at the hand of God. So you have your hunger and you have the provision of God. And so the question is, while you're in your desert experience, what do you turn to? Do you continue to complain about the fact that you are hungry or do you look at what God has provided for you and again, you just introduce, you taste it. Again, you taste it. And when you taste it, the thing that God provides for you, it is now going to begin to do something on the inside of you. The changing of one diet is something that may not occur willingly, voluntarily, forcefully, medically, and unexpectedly. I'm going to say that again, because you see, for us to change our diet and to turn to the things of God, it may come willingly. There are some of us that will willingly embrace what God placed before us and we eat it. Maybe uh, it, it may take force. Maybe it, 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 it's a medical condition that causes us to change and to uh, uh, embrace a new diet. I don't want to get ahead of myself because that's for next week. Maybe something unexpectedly happened. And then we allow those things that we're going through to aid and assist with us changing our diets. What will it take for you to change your diet this morning, both physically and spiritually, and eat what God has presented before you? Watch this. Be careful of the food that is presented before you. Let's take a moment to reflect on how, my God, the Israelites got here and what changed and transformed for them after spending four. 440 years, my God, imprisoned by the Egyptian. Watch this. And I talked about this in that before enslavement, the children of Israel had their own culture, they had their own customs, and they had their own identity form based on verbal and traditional uh, uh, and tradition that was passed on to them throughout the years. The Israelites had their own food that they ate. They had their own tradition that they embody and celebrate uh, uh, with specific food like what we do at Thanksgiving. So think about this, if you will. You're a part of a culture and a custom. There are certain foods that you used to eat. There are different times in the span of a year where you would cook certain food to celebrate, kind of what we do here in the U.S. in November where we celebrate Thanksgiving and think about this. You are used to doing that. And think about this, if you will. We are now taken from where we are, and we are now taken to the moon. Let me put it to you in a, in a context that you can understand it this morning. You are taken uh, to the moon, uh, and, and while you're on the moon, we have a desire for the things that uh, we used to eat here on Earth, but now we are on the moon, and so it is a different spread of food that is presented. We have two options. We can allow ourselves to eat what is presented, or we can protest and we can starve to death. And I just wonder who this morning is at that point as it relates to what God has presented before you to feast on this morning. Maybe there's a standoff this morning in that you're protesting and you're protesting and you're protesting and, 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 and in the standoff, God continues to provide for you. But in your protests, you can't see how your, <laughs> your ignorance in this moment is causing you more harm and more hurt than you would. Because understand this about the children of Israel, the group that started this journey, and if you look at so many different change and transformation that happened, the group that started this journey, it's not the same group that entered the promised land. So if you look at how our resistance to change and how we argue and fight with God affect us, it will cause you something. It will cost you something when we get to the place and the point in our walk in our relationship with God, where we begin to dismiss the things that God is asking us to do. Because when Moses left with the children of Israel, 
It is not the same group that God is having this conversation with in a time of reflection because there was this rebelliousness inside of them to change and to transform and to implement what God has in store for them. So God allowed those rebellious uh, uh, group to die out. And so now he has a younger generation that he is having this conversation with. And could it be this morning that spiritually we are dying because we refuse to embrace the diet that God has placed before us? And could it be this morning that as we look at our lives and reflect through scripture, could it be this morning that the Lord is sending this message to you to say to you that there is so much inside of you and he doesn't want you to die with what you have? Could it be this morning that the Lord wants to underscore and highlight and to explain to you this morning that the reason he allow you to suffer hunger is so that you can implement change in your life? And could it be this morning that as you read this text, you find that there is something inside of you, my God, that is reflecting on the years that you have wasted fighting against the, the things that God has placed before you? Could it be this morning that the reason God brings us to this place, explaining to you the importance of change in your diet, is so that you can do it, so you can enter into the promised land? Understand this about the promises that God has made over your life. The promises that God has made over your life, they are yea and amen. So if God declare something over your life, explaining to you that this is what you're getting ready to be, or this is what you will become. It simply means that change is imperative for you to get to or to become what God is calling you to be. And so the more we fight the things that God has placed before us, it's the more we delay and it's the more we get upset and it's the more we rob ourselves of the opportunity to be a blessing, not only to ourselves, but to the younger generation. Think about what the younger generation would have seen in the older generation in that they're learning from them constantly. God speaks to them and tell them to do this. And it is the older generation that fight and fought against the things of God and they miss the thing that God has in store. And now God has the younger generation and God is saying to the younger generation, remember the way that I take you for the past 40 years. And the younger generation seems to get it, they understand it, and they are implementing, they're making the necessary change to implement what God is now feeding them. They understand the importance of getting rid of disobedience out of their diet. They understand the, the, the importance of getting rid of stubbornness out of their diet. They understand the importance of getting rid of stiff nakedness out of their diet. Understand this about the group that God is having this conversation with. It is only two, two, out of the original group that left with Moses is now here to make the transition into the promised land. Think about that. It is said that there was a million plus people that left. And out of a million plus people that left, it is only two who is now here to have this conversation in Deuteronomy chapter number eight. Why? Because along the way, they change their diet, they implement the thing that God asks them to do. When you and I become rebellious, what we do, we put not only your deliverance on hold, but we put the younger generation deliverance on hold. And so God now has to be uh, 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 take his time now with the younger generation. But I want to encourage the younger generation this morning to implement and to apply the things that God is saying to you. Let the Lord have his way. As an enslaved people, new ideas, new ideas, new ideology was forced upon them. An option presented to them were either sink or swim. Know this. There are new, they, they were introduced rather to new spiritual reality 
they were introduced to these foreign gods that was repulsive and distasteful to them. They were introduced to God like Acre, which was the God of the earth and the horizon. They were introduced to Amon, which was a, a, a patron deity God. They were introduced to Anor, which was the God of warfare. They were introduced to these different gods when they were in slavery. I'm, 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 I'm coming down here because this is where I realize I have to continue this next week. And the, the appetite and their relationship with the God of Abram, Isaac, and Jacob was no in trouble. So while they were in slavery, again, everything about who identified them as Israelites were now taken. And think about this, if you will, when they were introduced to these things, the things that they were introduced to initially was very distasteful to them. So we understand that changing our, 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 our diets and, 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 and accepting what God has, it's a part of our walk in our relationship. So they're introduced to these things. These things are now forced upon them. Slowly it engraft and integrate into their lifestyle. Again, internally, the diet that they were fed by the Egyptian changed them internally, but externally they were still Israelites. Watch this. As time went by, their appetite, their taste, and their desire for the things of God slowly declined, and they were forced to make room in their life to change their desires for these new gods. Change. It's important. It's imperative. If we are going to grow as children of God. What God presents before us on a daily basis is food. 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 And if we feast on this in his presence, we are going to change internally. And the change that we experience internally will be now manifested externally. Again, at the onset of service, I asked the question, if I were to ask you to change your diet this morning, and for the next two years, have a steady diet of your favorite fast food, what would your response be? And I'm sure your response to that is, Pastor, that doesn't make any sense. And we can think about the clog artery, and we can think about the medical expenses that we would experience and how much it would cost us. Let me say this to you and I'm going to pray. I remember when I was much younger, my uncle said the following words to me. He said, Ian, you know, we are what we eat. And I remember when I was much, much younger, there was this gentleman that came from England and uh, gosh, I was probably about maybe six, seven years, years old. And I remember as a young boy, he was preparing a meal and he said to me, son, I'm going to say this to you. <laughs> and he said, this is going to stay with you for the rest of your life. And of course, when you are that young and someone says stuff like that, you, you, you tend to not pay much attention because if you're cooking and I'm hungry, just put the food in front of me so I can eat. And I remember him saying to, saying to me that you eat with your eyes. And when he said it to me, I said to myself, this doesn't make any sense. And I engaged him in a conversation. And I remember him deliberately played in the food and how he played it. It was not put together the way in which he played it his. So he played it two plates of food, he played it mine different, and he played it his. And he put both before me and he said, think about what I said to you in that, we eat with our eyes. 
And he said to me, which one of these two plates would you prefer to eat from? And I said, that one, which was the one that he played in? And it was well put together. It was presented properly. I say all of that to say this to you, that what was expressed to me then, I want to say this to you, consider this as you look at what God puts before you to eat. My uncle said this to me, and I'm going to pray after I share this with you. He said, Ian, you can do one out of two things in life. He said, you can spend your money and you can spend your money and you can buy food that's nutritional and good and organically grown so you can have a, a life that is not really affected by the foods that you eat. Or he said, option number two is this, you can simply eat what you want and you can go out there and eat just about anything that you want. And then later on, you're gonna pay the doctor bills, which would be very high. So in other words, what he was saying, you can take the money that you have and you can spend it wisely and eat properly. Or you can eat whatever it is that you want and later on you're gonna spend money and you're going to cause some doctor to be rich. We are what we eat, church. Spiritually, let me ask you this. Do you have a diet of fasting? Pray and read in God's word. Let me ask you this question. Spiritually, how are you nourished spiritually? Are you nourished in the presence of God where he tells you what to feast from in his word? Or are you nourished by these one-liners that we see here and there. And it just gives us this temporary relief or temporary satisfaction that says, hmm, this tastes good. Think about a mint that we eat or a Tic Tac. We put it in our mouth, tastes good for a while, but it's just a moment before eventually the, 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 the Tic Tac or the mint just fades away. Are you having that type of spiritual connection and relationship and a, 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 a nourishment with the Lord? Or are you feasting from what God placed before you in that he needs to take you in his word and feed you in his word? He needs to take you on the journey where like the songs that we sang this morning, Pass me not, O gently Savior. Hear my humble cry while another's now are calling. Do not pass me by. The songwriter said, Savior, blessed Savior, hear my humble cry while on others thou art calling. Do not pass me by. Let me ask you this. How much of a challenge would it be for you this morning? to change your diet. Understanding that what we eat matters. Understanding that what we eat can affect your health. I had this conversation with my son. He is now <laughs> playing soccer. And I'm trying to, you know, explain to him the importance of longevity. He is young and, you know, he look at his favorite soccer player that, um, you know, he's aspiring to be. And I remember sitting down with him one day and I explained to him that if you look at why this player has the longevity that he does, it's because of the food that he chooses to eat. And I say, if you are aspiring to do that and to become that, 
then you have to make the decision today to begin to change your diet and to begin to eat properly. I understand that there are some desires and some tastes that he has acquired over the years that is good. But if you continue to feast on those foods, guess what? The prospect of you becoming and having the type of longevity that those players have is reduced. So what we eat does matter. Of course, that doesn't, didn't go over well right away. And like you and I, we go back to some of the things that we were feasting on. But if we are serious about longevity and our walk and our relationship with God, he has brought us to this place for us to consider and to think about what we feed the spiritual man and what we feed the physical man. As it is right now, we can go out there and we can feed ourselves just about anything. And we can save and have a bank account that is this big. But know that what you feed yourself will affect your health. And what you have here in a bank, you are going to use that to pay some doctor when you're in the hospital suffering from some of these ailments that we can experience as a result of not eating properly. I believe the Lord is calling us individually and collectively to make some drastic decision about what we feed, not only the physical man, but the spiritual man. And the question for you is, how much of a challenge is this going to be for you? I understand desire and I understand taste. And let me, I know I say I'm going to pray. I remember when I got saved first. I remember Guinness Stout was something that I love. I have I, I, I developed a taste and it's an acquired taste. And I remember when I got saved, this was one of the struggles that I have as a child of God. God, how am I going to serve you? And what am I going to do with these desires and these tastes that I've developed that are a part of my life? And I remember going before him and my prayer to the Lord was, Lord, take the desire for these things away from me. And so that is what I'm going to pray this morning as I prayed then. And surely Daniel Gond, he delivered And I believe that Daniel God is getting ready to deliver again. Spirit of the living God, we come before you this morning. We come, O God, with all our struggles. We come, O God, with all of these deep-seated issues. And we come, O God, understanding the struggle to change our diet. We know, God, that this is something that is not easy. But with you, O God, all things are possible. Like the children of Israel, where you allow them to suffer hunger so you can introduce them to something new. Maybe it is, O God, that we are here individually and collectively hungering and thirsting after righteousness. And God, you are doing what you need to do to change our taste, our desire, and our palates to something that is new. New foods, God, it's something, it, it, it takes time. Some new foods take time for us to accept and for us to say yes and to make this a part of our diet and what we feed ourselves. And so we come before you this morning asking you, Lord God, to change our taste and our diet. God, we come desiring something that is new. But we understand, oh God, that these tastes that we have acquired 
physically, spiritually, takes time. But I thank you this morning, God, for Psalm 119 and verse 9. Where else can a young man change his or her ways? But by taking heed thereof according to the word of God. David said, thy word have I hid in my heart, O God, that I might not sin against thee. So a steady diet of your word in your presence is what enable us to experience change. We come this morning, God, and I hear you saying that the heart has to be changed in order to embrace and to implement that which you want to do in the heart. So we come, God, and we're not only asking you to change just the taste, but change our hearts, oh God, so that our heart will be a reservoir my God, to hold the things that you want to implement. God, we don't want to be like the initial group that came out of slavery, but because our refusal to implement and to do that which you're asking us to do, it is only two out of the original that went into the promised land. We come before you this morning and the change that we desire and we're asking you for this morning, God, is that we will experience longevity, on this Christian pathway. And that God, we implement the things that you impart unto us. And by us doing so, God, we can then turn to the next generation and we can mentor the next generation. God, I believe you want it to be different. Why? Because the weight and the responsibility that is now rested on the next generation because I failed to do my part. God, we come before you this morning and we're asking you to forgive us. Change our hearts. Change our hearts, oh God, to embrace the things that you put before us. God, so that we can feast on the things that you put before us. God, we find ourselves in situation where it's challenging. But like Job this morning, Job said, it was good for me, God, that I was afflicted, that I might learn. Change. Change us, oh God. Change our diets. Change our desire. Change the things that we are hungering and thirsting after, God. Let us not move after the things that Egypt, my God, has presented before us. Because an Egyptian way of life, it's not valuable in your kingdom. It robs us of the opportunity for a closer walk with you. Egypt in us causes us to be rebellious and causes us to be stubborn. So we're asking you, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. God, this morning, for those of us who externally looks like Israelite, but internally, my God, everything on the inside of us is an Egyptian way of life. We're asking you to change the diet that we're feasting on that causes us, my God, to be stubborn in, my God, implementing new things that you, you, you inform us of. This new generation, God, you expose them to manna. When you expose them to this new diet, they say, man, what is this? That's the literal translation of the word manna. What is this? The question, God, gives you an opportunity to fill in the blanks. So when you expose us to a new diet and we ask you, God, what is this? It gives you, oh God, an opportunity to fill in the blank. It gives you an opportunity to explain to us how this is beneficial to us in the long run. It gives you an opportunity, oh God, to sit and to talk with us about the importance of having a balanced diet. Spirit of the living God, we come before you this morning. And we come, oh God, just I grab me a plate real quick, son. We come, oh God, with our plates that we have been feasting on. Grab me a plate. And God, this morning, not one of them. This morning, 
we're looking at some of the things that have been on our plates over the years. And we're asking you this morning, Father, in the name of Jesus, help us. Help us this morning to make the decision as we look at what is currently on our plate that we're feasting from spiritually and physically. God, begin to show us some things that has to go. Why? Because as long as these things remain on our plate and we continue to feast from these things, it is robbing us of the opportunity of making it into the promised land. Stubbornness, rebelliousness, fighting against you, arguing with you, refusing to move when you tell us to, all of those things, God, that is on our plate. We're, my God, we have a steady diet of those things. We now come into your presence and we're asking you to change us and change our hearts because we want to continue to do everything that you have asked us to do. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh upon us this point. For those of us who have experienced, my God, your word, and your word has now gotten deep down on the inside. My prayer, O oh God, is that we will not lose this, but we will allow this to be the catalyst that cause us to turn around and to change. God, the things that we normally go after, let them become distasteful to us. And that when we try them, God, they, the, the, the allure, the taste, the desire for those things, God, I ask you this morning, God, to take those away from us. Take those things away from us so they become distasteful to us. And as you prepare our palates and our hearts, and as you introduce new foods to us, my prayer this morning, my God, is that we will just just rest in your presence and allow you to do what you need to do in us. God, we look to you this morning and we say thank you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Church, we are what we eat. And we have to be careful. We've got to be selective with the things that we eat. Because what we eat will affect our health, will affect our well-being, and will affect every area of our life. Because if we eat junk, we're going to end up in the hospital at some point. There was a young man who decided that he's going to eat, I think it was McDonald's. Obesity kicked in, and he ended up in the hospital. So the decision that we make to eat and to feast on certain foods can affect you both spiritually and physically. May the Lord bless you this morning. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May he lift up his countenance and give you his peace. And may the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, continue to rule your heart and cause you to see the importance of change. If it's one thing that we will all see and experience as a child of God for us to grow and to have longevity, it's the word change. And so if we change our diet, change what we feast, change what we feed ourselves, everything around us will change. And that's what God wants to do in your life. That's what he wants to do in my life. The question this morning is, will you, will you change and change your diet? God bless you. 
one of the things that we do at this point is not to end the service, but we play music. We play praise and worship music to continue to help you to deal with what God is doing on the inside. Because God's intention is to change, take Egypt out of us and implement his word in songs of praise so we can continue to grow from glory to glory. There are higher heights and deeper depths, but we don't get there until change is implemented. Our diets, our taste, and our desire has to be for the things of God. God bless you. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, rest, remain, and abide with you from this day. God bless you, and thank you.